Excellent. Um, how cool is this? This is great what you guys are doing. I love it. I love the background. Yeah, isn't this a good? <laughs> yeah. It was a marriage record. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. You're, you can't. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Kathy was the ascent, uh, the motivation behind yeah, us. I said I, said I quit. I yeah. quit. I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> Doing a better backdrop. Yeah. So um, kudos to Kathy for uh, coming up with oh, a lot of the design thanks, ideas thanks. for how that's going to look. And she came up with the idea to have the metals on a pole. And, and it's turned out really nice. So yeah. OK, so um, we just I'm, got the pictures. Yeah, we got the pictures and we were scrolling through them. So that's fun. It gives us some kind of talking points to kind of like, hey. So I'm going to hit the record button and okay. I'm going to formally start this off by saying, welcome back to our channel and um, our influencers and legends interviews of sand sculpture. Okay. And I'm so excited tonight <laughs> to have with us <laughs> with this interview, Mr. Dan Belcher. And uh, Dan Belcher has been an amazing sand sculptor for many years in this art. A lot of, of us uh, struggling artists have seen his wonderful work and said, I want to learn how to do it as good as Dan Belcher does it. Oh, please. Seen his work um, or been inspired by his work. You get so Go excited. Ahead. Are we we're filming? We're now? filming. I so. always does. Are we please. filming now? <laughs> yeah, I think I hit record. So okay. it's record. I see the button. Oh, okay. it's recording. <laughs> Welcome, Dan. Thank you for coming and doing this interview with us. We really treasure this time. And, and you've sent us so many beautiful pictures. And I can't wait to take the time to sit down and go over all of the life story about you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Greg and Kathy. Thank you for having me as a part of this. I, I feel honored. I don't know if I'm worthy of the level of, of the people you've had on, but I, I, I will at least admit that I'm lucky enough to be a link, um, especially between a lot of uh, a certain generation of sand sculptor and into a new generation. And uh, yeah, I've been lucky enough to be, have been doing it for just about 30 years full time. So yeah. That's great. So let's talk format for a minute. And if we just kind of take the approach of start from kind of the beginning, okay, you, you came out as a baby, not that far back, but, and then, and take us kind of march us into what you're going to do tomorrow, essentially the future. Um, okay. Is, is, as in a, uh, progressively organized way as you can. I think it's easier for our viewers to kind of get through half of it and then pick it up again and get through the next half or, or whatever. And then I think we have a goal. Every time we say we have a goal of getting about an hour and okay. we, we end up at an hour and a half, two right, hours. There's so much to share. Kind of like uh, the, 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 the one question I always want to make sure you cover is how you got into sand sculpture. But okay. I'm willing to say, go back before that and yes. kind of give us a feel for your your young younger life and kind of where it puts you mentally to be ready to kind of like grab sand sculpture for a living if that makes sense okay yeah so um just to give me an idea well i'm from st louis missouri as far away from the beach you know or at least the ocean as you can be um growing up we always you know we'd go to the lake uh you'd have beaches to play on we had a sandbox in the backyard dad built us a sandbox my two brothers and me so we love that you know as any good kids we love playing in the dirt um i always enjoyed uh drawing um uh, tried to be as artistic as i could be just enjoyed it um through my years in school i eventually went to school for architecture like you uh went off into landscape architecture out in Kansas, um, and funny enough, um, attending a convention in uh, Orlando when I was still a student, um, one of my, one of my good friends came over to me and just grabbed me, and he said, "Come with me." I said, "Well, what do you said? Just shut up, or I'm going to hit you. Come with me." All right, <laughs> that wasn't his his style, so he pulled me into the across the uh, convention center floor, and there before my eyes were these two guys building a professional sand sculpture 
and it just blew me away. It was this uh, space mountain kind of thing, but it was the most beautiful sand I think I had ever seen. This gorgeous light brown, the smoothest surfaces, the nicest details, and everyone was gathered around him. And um, I was just enthralled. And I think, you know, like any of us, I was, I mean, but I was a very quiet person, but I couldn't stop, you know, bugging these guys. So what year was this? And then who was it? About? <laughs> this was 89. Um, yeah, it was just like my second last year of, of college. And um, funny enough, I, after so many years of school and, and such and, and being tied to a, a drawing table or a desk and just be, you know, kind of worn out with it all because I was a horrible procrastinator at the time, something that sand sculpture has cured me of. Um, I would do a lot of all-nighters. So I was always working so, so many extra hours and, and really not looking forward to a life in an office at the time. And uh, I saw this thing, it, it was, you know, it was beaches and the visions of beaches and sand and creativity and, and growing up so far from the ocean, I'd always dreamed of being near the ocean. So basically just trying to bug this guy and say, how can I do this for a living? <laughs> or in any way shape or form and so okay 1989 and i'm still dying to know who was this guy <laughs> this was uh this was gary kirk and uh john cassidy and they were very kind to talk to me they they put up with my uh onslaught of questions over the next couple days i would come back whenever i had a chance and the great thing was that gary said uh Hey, you know, do you have, do you do, you know, can you send us some drawings? Have you done any sculpture? I said, no, I've really never tried sculpture. I'd love to. He said, well, send me some drawings. And, you know, this is the day before the internet, before email. So you had to go make some, uh, you know, color, color Xeroxes and uh, mail them off in a tube. And he looked at him. He said, you know, we've got a big project coming up uh, this summer. Um, I could use a, somebody who, you know, really doesn't have that much experience. So it was in Ocean City, Maryland, and it was a world record attempt. Um, I was, I went out there, he, he, I bought my own way, but he paid me a bit per day. And I was out there for 10 days, met some of the most amazing people, was part of this huge event. And it was just, it was a life-changing moment. I love it. So, oh, I, I, you know, what I find interesting yeah. in that story is that, Dan kind of knew early on all the hours that both of you spend doing this, you call it studio. You have to be in the studio during college, late night, staying up all night, getting projects done. And um, he figured out early that he didn't want to do that. Whereas I don't know. I didn't figure that out until I was 60 years <laughs> old, right? <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. There were aspects of it that I love, but I, I think I was just burnt out and the idea of, of you know, going right from there into an office job. Yeah, and I just knew it. I, I was I was fading in my in my uh, my desire to do it. I thought oh, I just don't want to, you know, sit at a desk and uh, do irrigation plans. You know, this yeah, is just you know, early on I, that, I that there's gotta be something more exciting for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, that's that's great. right. The, the, the beginning landscape architects had to do the irrigation plans, and the the fancy <laughs> partners got to do the rendered site plans yeah. and pick the <laughs> the hardscape designs. I get it. And you said yeah. that you did a lot of stairwells and bathrooms. Yeah, my early years <laughs> in architecture was stairwells and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Well, that that's a wonderful story. I know that uh, when we interviewed Ken Trolland, he said. Yeah, I remember meeting Dan Belcher in Ocean City, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And Kent said, were you on that one? And that one I didn't make. Um, Kent yeah. and I had just been through four or five of these back and forth between San Diego and Florida, doing the Atlantis and the Bluebeards and the Camelots and the Sleeping Beauties. Yeah. And I think this one in Ocean City, Maryland topped all those. It was bigger than all of them um height wise and that was a big pile we saw the photo you sent mm -hmm. with the formwork on top like a crown mm -hmm. oh it was it was enormous and, and uh, i've worked with that sand since i've worked uh, with mark mason to do some projects there since 
And funny enough, got to meet a guy who was on that original project, the local guy, uh, George Zeiser. Um, but, you know, working in that sand, that sand is, it feels really nice when you're carving, but it's horrible. It falls apart. It is just, once it loses moisture, you know, it wants to go down to an angle like this and the wind takes it. So that pound up at the top of that was quite adventurous. I think right off the bat, they realized, okay, that thing had to come down about halfway. Um, I wasn't working at the top. I, I got, uh, I was lucky enough to start off. I, I was working with um, uh, Jerry Quell, if you recall him. I don't know if you him. Uh, nice guy. He did some sand sculpture here and there, but then I, I got to work with Callie Bradford. So she was, uh, she got stuck with me with the, with the newbie working for a while. And then I got uh, put with uh, help. I, I got to help Mark Altamar. Um, he was on that project working on this huge dragon that went around the whole pile. Um, wow. I got to do that. That was, that was a blast and yeah, meet so many great people and, and hanging out with Kent. Um, that was, that was fun. He was, he's been a, you know, he's been a lifelong friend ever since. Yeah, he has kind words for Dan mm -hmm. Belcher. Yeah. <laughs> we were just talking to Kent this morning. Yes, yeah. Catching yeah. up with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious how those forms got up there. Who did that? Who? Well, probably Dan. <laughs> Someone had to get those forms up there. You know, it was funny. I, I had to find my own way out there. So I got, I arrived. I think I, I for some reason, I booked my, my flight a day early. Uh, my mom had booked my flight. You know, as I had never booked a flight in my life. Okay, well, you said something very curious that makes me want to add to my original question of how the forms got up there. How how old were you, like 22? Or how old were you when you went and did that job? Yeah, I think it was 1990, so I was 22. Um, I got there a day early. Um, I had booked my flight somehow a day early. Um, got into town, knew the ho the ho where we were working um, somewhat, and I started asking around, met the organizer, and uh, they put me in one of the side hotels and he, he actually had me do, run some errands for him over the next day. So I was the first one from that crew on the job, but they had had a crew out there for two weeks building up that pile and doing that compaction um, before we ever even arrived. Like I said, it was this guy, George, who had been a part of the project the year before. And uh, you know, poor, this poor guy, he's a couple years older than me, but he had been working his tail off for two years, really hoping to get the carve and then along comes, you know, some unknown kid, me, and suddenly I get to be on the carving crew, and he's thinking, hey, 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 what, you know, what gives, but uh, great guy, and all these, all these people end up being so nice, and, and I just, I just had a blast with the, just the most colorful personalities, I mean, good golly, you get Kelly Bradford and Mark Altamar in a room talking about some philosophical topic, it's going to go on forever, you know, or, yeah, you know, and you were so impressionable. Obviously, it tainted you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Stuck you right into sand sculpture. Yeah. Oh, all, and all that education your mom paid for. Um, <laughs> she supported him. She booked his flight. That's right. That, that's <laughs> you, know, you know, it is. It is funny after going through college and everything, and uh, uh, my parents. And I'll tell you later on, I, I didn't get to do any more projects with Gary. Um, but after I got out of college, I met Todd here in St. Louis working on a project. And after I got, I, it was a couple of months, it, it rolled into full-time work. And, you know, my parents were just shaking their heads like, well, what do you, you know, kind of, what are you doing? They really enjoyed it, but they were just so, you know, they wondered, how are you going to make, you know, how are you making a living? Is this viable? And, you know, they were my they were my biggest supporters, my biggest fans. They, you know, it would just be so funny. I'd run into somebody I know in town and, oh, your mom was showing me photos of your last project and your dad. And he's, my dad would always wear shirts that I brought back for him from different projects. So yeah, once you show them that you can actually make a living out of it. Yeah, it, and, and that's still an issue today. Um, I have a, a, a sand sculpture up in my driveway that I've been playing with. I use it for the sandcastle tip of the day. And okay. yeah, it's, you know, at eight foot tall. I, it, it could be considered a Todd Vanderplan fantasy castle, right? Inspired right. by the master himself. And the neighbors come in and say, 
Um, and two, a pair of ladies came that I hadn't seen before, and I'm out working, you know, carving a window. It's just neighbors walking by. Yeah, not walking the street. Yeah, we converse. And one lady looks at the other and then looks at me and says, "Does your wife let you do this?" <laughs> and and it's like you know, there's this realization that still around the world today, most people don't realize that there's a small niche of people that call this their livelihood, mm -hmm. that they've made their living doing this, mm -hmm. that they're not homeless, they're not <laughs> sleeping under a we free made house. like it sometimes, but. Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> you're, you're homeless because you're traveling the world to some of the most exotic places in the world, meeting some of the most amazing people at the, at the same time, bringing joy to the world, um, doing a very uh, obscure art that's always been considered child's play, and temporary. And they always struggle to want to ask me, can you make it permanent? Right. Because everybody wants that ceramic pot, that's permanent. That oil painting, that's permanent. Or, I mean, it's permanent. Or when they think it, of sculpture, they think of yeah, marble. Rock, marble or, rock. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've had a lot of people come up with ideas to try to make them permanent, but they're really, nobody's really mass produced a way to do permanent sand sculptures. It just hasn't really happened. Anymore. And I don't think they should be. There's something about come to my driveway and see this castle. <laughs> it's gone next week and people will come. If it's always there, they'll go, I'll see it next month. And next month never comes. If that, I, I don't know mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I, I have, I have boxes of print photos before, before digital photos that are, are a testament to why they shouldn't be permanent. I look at so many of these things I did when I started, I think, oh, thank God nobody can see them because, you know, they're locked away in the vault. You know, I, you realize that, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged, well, there's two sides of it, I guess, is that you, you start off, and, and I guess we can go through this at some point, is the evolution of sand sculpture. You know, in the beginning, when you guys started it, when I uh, jumped in, so many people started it off as a hobby and something that it was a way to get into sculpture, not trained professionals, but it was the enthusiasm. So the artistic level and, and the time frames didn't always allow that, especially in a lot of the contests, it was, you know, build it big, bang it out. And, you know, you, you were always enjoying progressing up those levels and it always seemed like big steps, but, you know, now you look back at what you can achieve and you think, oh my goodness, that was, it's funny that I really thought I was, but you, you know, you, it, it's good that you could see the progress because it kept you moving forward. But, you know, I look at some of those things, I think, oh my goodness, I'm glad nobody can see that, you know. So let me ask you a question about that. So do you think it was like um, the fact that the art was young and, and it was just starting it's kind of like a, like almost like a got started with Todd in a way, like the, it was a young oh, okay. art yeah. and that the artists were, um, I'm going to use the word young, you know, young in experience. And then later on, of course, you know, people get their skill level up. And then even beyond that, um, I, I don't know, there's people with fine art degrees that some of the, the sculptors that have come to the B Street Pier. Right, the Europeans or uh, Russians. Yeah, or, well, yeah, so yeah, let's talk about the evolution. What do you think? Well, you know, Greg knows more about the early years than I do, but what I was able to see when I came in and I heard all these stories about these, these big um, grand one day beach contests, essentially what you had to do, you were working on a tidal beach. So there was a limited amount of time. So to get the most bang out of it, you had a 10 man team and you only had so many hours. So you had to work as efficiently as possible. Um, you had to practice that many times, many times over not, I mean, you guys did it to the nth degree, which is just still unbelievable to look at those photos. But right. I would hear that those stories from Todd mm -hmm. and then from um, Greg, <laughs> Greg Glenn and Brad Gall and, and Kevin Crawford and all these guys, I, I just soaked up all these stories of just, you know, some of these, they would go out, they would have all their forms and they knew the spot on the beach where they'd want to be. Well, they would go out while the tide was still up. So they're, you know, chest deep in water, holding their forms, waiting to grab that piece of beach because they knew where they wanted to be. I mean, this is, a, this is extreme, but 
<laughs> it was that those contests were four, five, I don't know, maybe six hours, but from, from the whistle, you shoveled and then you went from straight into shoveling, almost ready to just hurl to trying to carve and get everything done by the end and do, and it was all about the maximum and getting the most bang for the buck. Now, now we're very fortunate that it has progressed and contests have become, um, you know, they found a way to optimize it so that the events can make money. They can um, compensate the artists. Uh, you have more time over a number of days. You're not working on a tidal beach. Um, and we have more forms, more, more available to us to be able to create, you know, better pieces of work. And I think, you know, sadly enough, I've, I've seen a lot of people over the years, even really great sculptors have come to sand sculpture and they look back and they say, oh, I can't believe, oh, you guys treated it as a sport or it's all about the shoveling or why, why weren't the sculptures better? And you say, well, you, you have to know the environment that these guys were working in. You know, I, 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 I got in right after um, a lot of those contests had just gone away. Mm -hmm. So I never really got to experience that, but we did start, you know, going to Harrison where we were Harrison Hot Springs World Championships and working in those. And that was the next, that was the next level. Those team competitions there were grueling. Yeah, and I, I think Harrison was a, a real groundbreaker for sand sculpture and the competition world itself. Um, I remember, I think his name was Bob Bell, right? The event. Yeah, and sadly, Bob just passed away this year. Passed away, yeah, recently yeah. this year, um, or earlier in the year. Um, he called me and we talked quite a few times about, hey, there's got to be a way we can organize this so that you can have a three-man team, but you get five days. If you have a five-man team, you get three days. And there was this kind of a, an organized breakdown of the more people you bring, the fewer days. The fewer people you bring, the more days. Right. And I think there was a sweet spot that most of the teams that went and did well fell into, somewhere between four and six people. Exactly, yeah. Ended up being the sweet spot. And I think you... You competed in many of those contests. I, I have to admit, I never made it to Harrison. Um, yeah. I was asked to go and partner with different people. I'm sure you were. Three, four, yeah. five different times. Yeah. I never was able to squirrel away from whatever building I was responsible for trying to get built or drawn or whatever right. to make it up there. And now there aren't any more 10 man team competitions are there that you know it doesn't sound like not really i think you know the imperial beach u.s open of sand castle went away in 2011 i think was mm -hmm. its last year that one was a 10-man event and then what took its place a couple years later i think they had um been going back and forth but dan is right when he says that that whole 10 man thing kind of has faded away mm -hmm. at least from a, a higher art standpoint i'm sure there's a lot of 10 man contests that are like corner del mar's event i think you might be able to put 10 people on a team but that's a i call a mom and pop they don't invite the master artist to come they don't pay commissions for them to come and there's there's two levels of contest. There's a level of contest that has essentially gotten to a point where you can uh, bring in the best and have a master's competition multi-day. Since essentially what we created uh, at the B Street Pier with the US Sand Sculpting Challenge and 3D Art Expo. And I, I know, Dan, you've been there many of those years for that event. Thank you for coming. I've been, yeah, I've been very honored to be a part of it, I think, three times, three or four times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is exactly how Dan explained it. He explained it very well. He goes, hey, um, they've created a venue for us artists to really show off our skills. They've given us three or four days. They've provided far more. All I have to do is drag my dirty clothes. We'll get to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> all from over the world the last event i came from and um and a few tools and the big tools are provided and um i get to go play for three or four days 
and then go rush off to the next place to do the same thing. And if I, I'll be lucky if I get a day off in between. Right. And we've essentially created a, a little mini tour and have kept many artists busy from literally, you know, May, June, all the way yes, into the yes. fall. Yeah. Until I find it very us, curious right? <laughs> as well. I find it very curious that, um, I mean, you said something so interesting that there's a, a thought that it was a competition versus a high art, but maybe that's just how it got started, how to, how to. Well, there, there's also an aspect that you have to remember too, is that all these contests, it was the lure of the grand prize, right, Greg? I mean, nobody got any compensation. There was first place or nothing. So, you know, not that people were even really doing it for the prize. It was, it was the glory. It was, it was the glory of winning, but also trying to win so that you could, you know, you guys would drive from Southern California, you know, all the way up to White Rock, British Columbia, or, you know, all the way out to the, all the way out to Virginia beach or whatever contest was going on. People would go back and forth, you know, the Pacific Northwest, those guys up there, they would drive down to, uh, um, IB Imperial IB, Beach. Yeah. 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 Yes. So it was, there was, there was no compensation, but every, most people were doing it as a hobby, um, a, an intense hobby, but they were doing it as something that they just enjoyed for, for mm -hmm. the, the camaraderie, the spirit and the, mm -hmm. the creativity of it. And that's what pulled these people in. Now, when we started doing Harrison, they said that they had told me that when I got invited to go up after working the first couple months with Todd some of the guys asked me to be a part of um, Ted Siebert and, and, and Charlie Bolio asked me to be a part of their team and 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 it, the Sandscapes guys and everybody was telling me they said yeah this is a unique event because it's multi-day um, because another aspect of that too was that not only did you have multi-days to work on your piece two and a half really which didn't end up being a whole lot but you also had the evenings to get to know people because they said one of the tragedies of the huge, um, the huge 10 man team one day events was that you got there in the morning and you're planning your whole scheme. You get done, there are thousands of people, you're cleaning up, there's a award ceremony, boom, either you crash in whatever vehicle you did or you're going home you don't even get a chance to hang out yeah you're exhausted mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been a 20 hour day because mm -hmm. you're filling water buckets at 6 a.m <laughs> yeah. to because yeah. you want to have the most water stored next to your plot to beat sure. the guy sure. uh, because no way is charlie bullio going to come down from seattle and beat us you know that kind of thing so, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first time I saw some of that camaraderie was in Parksville. And I thought that was fantastic in the evenings. And, and that's one of that's one of the greatest things that has uh, manifested over the years is just getting to know so many interesting people making friends all over the world. You know, I, I could say I've I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have coworkers and friends and, and acquaintances. And even now with Facebook, you know, it's funny to get to know someone's artwork and you've never met them. And you're basically saying, I can't wait for the day I can actually see your artwork in person. You know, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully one day we'll be on the same project in the same, in the same contest. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how you can go um, certain times with certain people you will see them, somebody from across the globe, and you will meet up with them on four or five different projects throughout the year. And then you may go five, six years without seeing them. And then you come back around and it's, you know, it's like no time has passed. Yes. Impressive. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to get us back on track with something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So you got introduced to sand sculpture. You, you, you met Gary Kirk, you met John Cassidy, then you, Within a month, months later, you met um, Todd Vanderplein. It sounds like Greg. That was, yeah, that was, that was about a year and a half later. Yeah. Okay. And then you're headed off to Harrison and you're doing some projects there. Um, let's kind of pick up with some of those Harrison projects and some of those people. And I, I want to mention one project that I saw and thought, I love this piece. 
but I didn't know who did it. And it's the piece that has the, the warrior with kind of that starburst behind him. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so t tell me the story behind that piece. Was that your solo work? Were you partnered with other people? No, that, was that? That, was, that was funny because I, I had been lucky enough after my first year of, of doing Harrison and being scared to death to be up there and, and knowing that I really didn't know anything. You know, I worked with Ted and Charlie, God love them. They, they had me on their team the first year, my first year in 92. We were right next to Kevin, Greg and Brad Sandscapes and they just blew, you know, they blew everybody away, but I had years. Yeah. I'm sorry? For many years they did, right? Yeah, well this, the one year they, that was the first year they had won, um, but it was this jungle book and just amazing. And Brad did these elephants and everybody's, you know, we're, it, it was just incredible. And I'm looking at that saying, oh man, I hope one day I can get there. I got to know those guys and uh, funny enough, the next year they wanted to put together a larger team. Well, they put together a team of four and who got to be number four. And I thought, you guys gotta be kidding me. So they asked me to be a part of their team, um, which was, uh, that's a story in itself. We, we did something with some interior forms and it was basically a, a, going to be hollow. What we went through with that and the impending downfall it was it was epic it was epic but to, to move forward so we had done the team in various iterations Charlie Bolio Fred Dobbs Alan Matsumoto Dave joined us once um, you know we found that sweet spot once Harrison found a way they said oh we'll we'll do it according to man hours because some of the if you had like a three-man team you only had like 66 man hours but a 10-man team had 100 man hours and, and Greg was always the most you know vociferous person in that arguing for equity in, in man hours. So finally you've got that and you found that, yeah, that sweet spot was like four to six people. So we did uh, that team so many times. And then I think there, they, we got to a point uh, after 2003, four, I think I missed 2004. We didn't do a team that year. And the next year I came back to do solo. I had never done solo, but you know, it was funny. I just wanted to try something that was outside of what I had ever really attempted. Um, you know, trying to learn anatomy and a dynamic figure and how much can you do in that amount of time. And, and I settled on this. Uh, I was inspired by this. And, you know, it's, it's some great work. We were studying Versailles, the Palace of Versailles and the gardens in school. And there's this great golden fountain of Apollo coming out of the out of the waters and the horses and the water jets and everything but I just thought it was just this him on his chariot you know and I kind of did a takeoff on that but that was the essence of the the figure so that was something mm -hmm. I just took nice yeah thanks and I, I went from I went from you know that team mentality of a lot make a lot and I still made too much I should have boiled it down a little bit more but just trying to say okay let's just try to see what you can do and enjoy it and see what see what you can create right gee enjoy it yeah really novel idea, well, right? not that we didn't always enjoy it but okay. enjoy it on a different level but do, you, do you remember was that a grand prize winner for solo or was that do you remember uh, I, I was very, I, I, I took first place that year and that was also the first time I had ever won a Sculptor's Choice Award. Um, so that was, you know, it's one of those things, you know, you can win and, and people can say, well, I thought this or that. And there's always people who think something else, but I was just happy with what I had done. And to get that Sculptor's Choice, that meant that not only the people picked the judge liked it, but you know, a lot of more of, of your peers um, mm -hmm. appreciated and I got some nice compliments. So that, that spurred me on to say, okay, maybe I can, you know, I can take my carving to the next level and not, you know, a, a prior to that, doing a lot of projects and, and God love them, I was working with Sandscapes, but, um, and they kept me busy and they're my, you know, they taught me so much, but we did a lot of these projects at these fairs and a lot of these fairs, they want the cartoony, you know, animal band and all this stuff. And you can have a lot of fun with that, but sometimes you're just thinking, I want to test 
you know, I want to see if I can do something beyond that. And it gets a little bit, uh, you know, repetitive. We always did some great projects, but we had a lot of those, you know, where it was fun and it kept, you know, it paid the bills, but you're thinking, okay, what, what else can I do? What else can I try? Yeah. I, I, I feel for you, uh, in that kind of journey of, um, creativity because we do a lot of what we call corporate work mm -hmm, where, mm -hmm. you know, the client sends us the logo and, you know, the logo's 90% of what they really care about. And the other 10% can be where our creativity is. And it's like a wave at the bottom or something. So, right. you know, simplistic, uh, but it pays the bills. And, you know, it's right out of that book, uh, how to win friends and influence people. Everybody likes to hear the sound of their name or see it written. Mm -hmm. You say, I heard you say that in the interview with Dave. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've taken that and we understand it as, as artists. And fortunately I have a partner, Ko Tanaka, who does this with us. Um, and Great he guy. does a lot of this logo work quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do a lot. Of, I've done a, um, some project, Mark Mason in Florida. They do a lot of uh, corporate events, team building events, and these He's found that, uh, you know, the best thing to do in the beginning is when you hit the beach in the morning before all the people come out is you shovel up as big a pile as you can and you, you do the logo, you know, and boy, that just, there we are. There's our name in sand. You, you know, you can energize them to do a lot when they see that. Yeah. 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 That's the start. That's the start. It makes a great photo off too. So you have interacted with a lot of people and you wanted to talk about some of the people and share your experiences that you had had with them. Yeah, I, well, I, I have to say I've been very, I've you been very- You sent us some fortunate. photos and I'm like, wow, Charlie Bulio was one hot guy out there. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he, was a, he was a stallion and he's a, he's a, he's a yeah, it's, uh, it's funny you realize time like I looked at old photos of you know I, I just look at this kid with you know long bright blonde hair and you know a twinkle in his eye of me and I'm like oh my goodness you know and you, you know, oh I don't even want to look in the mirror but uh, yeah I've I've been very lucky to have met a lot of those a lot of um, the originators you know as many as I could in the beginning I I got to work with Mark Altamar um joe i got to meet joe mays early on um you know kelly todd gary you know and then to meet all of you guys and to you know to meet you and to meet dave henderson and kent trollin and all you know and then uh, the guys that work with todd but yeah all of these people and walter and sandy you know from from down in south padre and mm -hmm. and to hear that what was what's fascinating to me and always has from the beginning is that even though like when I worked with Callie and, you know, and Gary, and they would say, oh, well, you know, this person came up with this, or I came up with this name for this company, or I originated forms, and then Todd, I originated, you know, and I know that it all really is a, you know, it's, it, 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 it is a group activity over time, but to hear like how Mark Altamar started the way he did his uh, beach carving and, and working to the crowd and busking and doing things only with his hands, and then uh, to see Joe Mays, um, to meet him and see how he did his artwork with soft sand too, with all these Formica tools and how he played to the crowd. They, to be a, not just to be a, an artist like they were, but to also be, to be showman. Showman, right. Mm -hmm. Performers. You have to do that, you know. Yeah. Um, we're very lucky in a lot of times, and I know I've been, um, I got bad at that for a while, and I think Dave mentioned this too, where you, you really just want to put the headphones on and focus on what you're doing and you don't want to answer answer this you know what do you do if it rains 10,000 times in a day but uh there are people that you know and todd todd and gary are definitely showmen oh my goodness todd you get him going to a crowd and it's a it's a thing to watch you know so yeah. it's fascinating to see those personalities yeah he mentioned that you know we're we're there to create an experience for our clients and to communicate with the, the public as part of that experience. And, yeah. they, you know, they're obviously going to have a thousand questions mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, I guess you got to assign somebody to be the question taker <laughs> and have that be their 15 minute, half hour break. 
because yeah. I mean, we all needed that mental, you know, get away from the piece and think about it and then come back to it. Right. And if you cycle a team, it, that, that can be effective. And I, I was lucky, I think with Todd early on, I was, I was, I had a, ten, you know, very much a tendency to just want to work what I was working on. I always felt that if somebody was watching over my shoulder, they knew that, oh, look at him. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's a fraud, you know. Um, or that piece broke off, or, right. I'm sorry? Or that piece <laughs> fell off. Yeah, and yeah know. you know, or you just, oh, what is, what is that supposed to be? But, uh, and even Todd said, okay, there's a television crew showing up. He said, you're going to do the interview. I said, oh, no, 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 no. And I had done things like that, but I thought, I, I don't want to do this. I just want to work. He said, no, nope, Dan, you're going to have to learn this is part of the job. This is what you have to do. You have to get comfortable with dealing with these. I said, but I just don't want to deal with these reporters, you know, and what they're going to ask. It's the same thing. He said, you have to, you have to guide them to what they really want to know. And he taught me quite a few things. He pushed me out in front of, you know, in front of the camera. And that was a great thing, you know, to just, you know, push you out of the nest and fly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and, and he'd have you out on a job and he was on the next job or the last job or the job in between. And you had to be the spokesperson. You had to be the person there. Yep. In charge. Yep. Yeah. When it got busy for him, he was spread thin and he had multiple projects going on in different places. And sure. He depended on a lot of people to help him make those amazing, you know, like well. The, Yes. Yeah, when I started when I started with Todd in the early '90s, um, I got into it full time, and he was so busy. Uh, we would have three or four projects going on at, at different times, and groups of us in different places. And then same thing with Sandscapes. When I started really working with them, a um, couple years later, you know, uh, Greg would be running one project, Brad and I would be on another one. Kevin was on a different one. And, you know, maybe Fred and, and Ted or Ted Fred and some, you know, somebody else is are working on another, you know, f different projects going on. So, yeah, you've got it. You've got to run sometimes. And a lot of times we're on projects by ourselves and sometimes you're in over your head early on and you just had to uh, problem solving. That was one of those things we really learned a lot about was, OK, how do you make this happen in the worst of scenarios? Yeah, work with what you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I always like to uh, ask the artists that we're interviewing, uh, do you remember where we met? Yes. Okay, so tell your story about when you met me, and I'll try to remember my story of when I met you. <laughs> well, um, like I, I think you said before, I had told you when I met you, that I said, I said, I just, I, just, I just know so many stories about you because uh, we met in Quebec City, um, Expo, Expo Quebec um, contest and I believe it was 2001 I'm trying to remember I came up to do uh, doubles with Fred Dobbs and I think you were working with with Jill at the time you, the two of you were, were doubling together so yeah it was that was a new adventure for me to be up at that my first time up at that contest and uh, yeah I got to finally got to put a a face to the name and you know i had seen photos obviously but i heard all the stories so well they're all true if they <laughs> told them right <laughs> um yeah i remember you did the three musketeers yeah and i think oh, you were nice. there it's a remember... beautiful piece oh yes i remember that piece yes and oh, maybe okay. i dig real deep mm -hmm. i can find a yeah. photo of that piece um, that's when I, I saw some photos recently and that, that was one of those where i think i was looking at the anatomy of it and i thought oh my goodness those are those are ones of the hide way but yeah we had fun you know yeah. it, it turned out uh excellent it was excellent yeah. yes and uh, yes. i remember i was doing that uh gothic cathedral yes with Jill and I, I literally poor design. Um, you know, I, I didn't have enough uh, buttressing support on that for its height, and that thing fell on us. And I think it's one of the few times I've had a contest piece fall. You know, like yeah. that one did. Yeah. And then I think in it was a shame because it was it was gorgeous. Yeah, and all the cut throughs, the hollows, and everything. Yeah, it was it was off to a great start. Uh, yeah. I think I have progress photos. I'll try to put them up. Um, and then I, I ended up considering that unfinished business. 
And 12 years later, at the U.S. Sand Sculpting Challenge, mm -hmm. I recreated that piece with my daughter, Pam. Mm -hmm. I thought and, I saw another iteration of that, yeah. 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 And this one was better designed. I had more experience as an architect then. <laughs> and uh, um, I, had, I had run across some really good books and a, and a documentary about how these cathedrals stood up. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, stress analysis that they were doing showing how the stresses were transferred to the ground and, and literally these flying buttresses with the little pinnacles on them. Those the pinnacles, pinnacles were the added weight yeah. and compression that actually helped hold and withstood the buttress. So um, literally adjusted the design and we ended up with a, a, a prize winner mm -hmm. uh, that year at the U.S. Sand Sculpting Challenge, whereas the piece we did in Quebec went, went quickly from one of the leaders to um you know one of the followers <laughs> will say but you pushed it and that's one of those things you learn from it yeah yeah well it's one of those things if you if you always go safe you know what are, what are you learning but it's, it's right. the it's the juggle between you know having something at the end you know or and 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 pushing your boundaries so it's a balancing act yeah it is i i, I read something recently that touched on that if you're always playing it safe, are you ever really going to grow? Right. It's like, and, and especially at, at contests, because, you know, uh, people will know what you can do and they'll say, you know, as much as you're not in, in these contests supposed to be judged against yourself, you know, it's, uh, they know that, oh, well, you know, I, I know they can do more, you know, I know they can push it, push it more. And, and then also against your other competitors, if they, you know, if they push, push the material harder, you know, it, um, it's not a good show for yourself. Right. Yeah. Well, um, now you, you went to Europe and worked in Europe as well. Other places? Yeah, I've, I've been, you know, that's one of the greatest things about sand sculpture for me is, is growing up, you know, um, well, I, not having much of a chance to do a lot of traveling as a kid but with sand sculpture it, it took me across the country and seeing big cities small towns that i never would have seen places around the u.s that i never would have been and then on to canada uh australia uh, japan china parts of parts of europe um it's funny that i sometimes i say to people that the number of places that I've had to turn down because I've had other projects probably outweighs the number of places I've been. I've been lucky enough to do a lot of projects around the world multiple times. So maybe, you know, Rich Verano uh, asked me to do a, a project uh, near Venice and Yeslo years ago. Right. And I was able to go back to those two projects many times. You know, you go to Australia for the same projects many times but uh it's still it's i i'm just so lucky to have been able to see the world and as you know greg studying architecture and studying architecture history and and history in general you get to some of these locations and you have things locked in your brain from that you know from that lecture from that book and you say i'm i'm gonna get there i want to see this and when you finally see those things in person you know, you get to Florence, you get to Rome, you get to Venice, you, you know, you get to London, you get, you know, you see Stonehenge. And, you know, I, I got to go to, once I was traveling to Bahrain and I had been booked on a flight through Istanbul and I had eight hours. And I said, that's, I'm getting out. So I, uh, I got off the first plane. How do I get out of the airport? I had to pay a, a visa duty, you know, um, I had to find a way. Guy told me how you know which trains to take. I went down to the Hagia Sophia, the Blue Mosque. I wandered around. Um, my camera broke. I got no photos. This is before you know cell phones. Right, right. But it, I just took it all in and got so enthralled with it. I, I made it back. Luckily, I looked at my ticket and realized they had bumped up the flight an hour earlier than I had thought. Oh, wow. Luckily, got on a packed train, you know, made it back um, there. And, but I had to see it. I wasn't going to be in Istanbul and not see those things. 
right? Certainly. Oh my God. Certainly. Yeah. So you, you've been to Totori. I have. I have. Yeah. So t tell us a little bit about your experiences in Japan and Totori. Oh my goodness. That that is one of those where you are in with a mix of sculptors that they're great friends, but you're constantly in awe and you're constantly trying to live up to being worthy of being on that ticket, you know. Right. Um, it, uh, uh, Katsuhiko has organized, been the uh, sculptor organizer for that, uh, for those folks in, 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 in Totori for, for so long. I, I first got to go years ago when they had a contest, an outdoor contest, uh, 10 of us, and that was just, that was a wonderful, wonderful trip to spend, I think we were there for about 12 days. Wow. A 10 day contest, I believe, um, 10 people from different countries. And we just had a, just a great camaraderie, a great time. And he's such a gracious host and the city are wonderful, they're gracious hosts. And we had had this horrible rain at the end the, of the last day of the contest. So we had just said, okay, next day we're going in. Even after the, they had announced the awards and we went in and we, we fixed up all the sculptures that had some damage because they were going to be on display for quite a while. They came back and we were supposed to have, I think, two days off in Totori and Totori and they said, no, we're, we're going to um, take you guys to Kyoto. We're going to, we planned a bus trip. So we got to, got to go to Kyoto and we got to see the gardens and the temples that I had studied. And right. that was just uh, an incredible trip. And then to go back from 2012 when they opened the permanent sand museum, they had done a, a sand museum under a tented structure for a couple of years before I was ever able to go there. So I've been lucky to be able to go uh, many of those years in between. Unfortunately, this year there was no project because they're keeping up last year's project because of COVID restrictions, they open late. So they're just gonna make use of that one right. for this year, but just an incredible group of, of carvers and the level just you know keeps going up and it's one of those every year you go well maybe my last year you know maybe <laughs> I'll get replaced next year but you know you just you consider yourself fortunate just to go back every time you can there's roughly 10 10 sculptors 12 14 oh about 20 they it's 20 yeah yeah so I think around there boy I'm trying to remember I think we had 19 yeah. yeah. So yeah, just some really, really great things and some great people and uh, great pieces come out of that. And uh, it's a it's 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 a really good sand to work with. Um, sometimes we get there and you get there in March, and sometimes the weather is beautiful, and we've gotten there at times, and it's just so cold inside there, and you'll get snowstorms outside, and usually by the time the project finishes it's you know first first week of april and it's sunny and the cherry blossoms are coming out right right mm -hmm. yeah. so it, it's like three weeks of work right um it's usually a 12-day car for most of us a couple people go in earlier to start some of the bigger projects and then uh uh used to be well uh leonardo ugolini always goes in early he starts off this um uh, usually a monster um top scene with a lot of architecture and a lot of character and uh, he will always go in quite a bit earlier uh Ilya Filamontsev would go in and do just these oh, just incredible yeah. scenes with all of these figures um he has since I think the last year he took a break from that to work on one of the normal size projects and a couple of the other uh David Ducharme and uh Suze, um Suzanne, yeah, Suzanne went in and they, they took that over to a few other people. So it, it changes around a bit. Right. So, How long does it stay up? Yeah, you're out. Oh you my know, gosh. And they, yeah, so so they, get, they get the pound ups done. We would go in middle of middle of March, carved till early April. And as soon as we're done, man, they are cleaning up and putting in flooring and plants and lighting and water features and everything. So they usually end up opening, I believe, late April and then the end of the year um finish it off demolish it start start new compaction 
That's fantastic. Yeah, so yeah, we I would really we, like to walk through that. We talked a little bit about mm -hmm. hey, there should be a sand mm -hmm. museum in the States or something, you know. Mm -hmm. What what why should it be is such a far away place to go to? <laughs> but um, you know, that's uh for uh, I guess another dream, another time. Anyhow, there are um, always places to go. Yep, mm -hmm. there are always places to go. Um so I'm I'm gonna throw back uh um and bring back a, a memory of um, an event that's more recent now that we've kind of progressed into time. Um, we were roommates at Parksville. Yes, we were. Um, <laughs> a, about three years ago, two, three years ago, depending on how you, you call it. And I, I remember, um, um, I, I forget who was helping organize from their committee, the rooms and who's gonna share. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'd be willing to stay with Dan Belcher, but m maybe nobody else. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I guess I was lucky enough that Dan said, yeah, he'd tolerate me too. Oh, heck yeah. And uh, um, my, well, nobody else would want a room with you. That's that was it. probably the case. Yeah. Oh, come on, come on. Easiest, easiest roommate in the world. Yep. So, um, uh, what I remember about the, the and you had, you had already touched on it, uh, it was fun to reconnect with the sculpting community. Yes. Um, uh -huh. You know, I've, I've had a 40 year career of, of sandcastles being something I snuck in during my two weeks of vacation time from a traditional job as an architect and a real estate developer. And um, it, to, to be able to get away. Part of the reason I wasn't able to do the Harrison deal is by the time you travel up there, it's a whole day, travel home a whole whole day, be there, it's four days, three, four days. All of a sudden, um, half my vacation time was consumed and I was valuably using those, you know, 10 or 15 vacation days to do one day jobs local right. in Southern California, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, uh, you know, now, uh, the, uh, you know, I, I think the most recent chapter of my life, I was able to negotiate a couple extra weeks of vacation time. And I was able to actually start to go on these bigger jobs, longer jobs. Um, I remember uh, partnering with Sue McGrew up at um, Expo um, in Toronto. In Toronto. Okay. Yeah. The Canadian National Expo. Mm -hmm. CNE, yeah. Uh, CNE. Yeah, Karen's, um, Karen's competition, yeah. Yeah, Karen Freilich puts that on. She does a fabulous job with that. Um, I, I, and then also able to take the time to go up to Parksville because that's, you know, by the time you get there and you're there for the three or four days and you get home, that's a week. And I was lucky enough to have you and Pam come up for that and uh, be part of hanging out with the sculptors and going out to dinner and, and meeting people. And, it was fun. And you know, the, <laughs> the costume party, you mean you didn't bring clothes for the, the costume party? And I'm like, what costume party? Um, I guess I could always go as a, yeah, I, I, I guess I could go as a streaker. I got that costume with me all the time. <laughs> Well, I was I was so excited when I heard that you were coming. That was fun because it was great, so great to see you be able to go up to one of those, one of those contests where it was. It is it, it is one of the larger gatherings, um, and they're able to do it in quite a confined area, but mm -hmm. so many uh, uh, doubles and solos. So that quite a few people are able to go to that event. And it makes for a nice group gathering. So it's great to see that you were going up, and it's it's nice to see that you, you could you get to meet all these people, and hang out for so many days, and even beyond like a three a two day event or something where you're you're you get to meet people, but it's still moving pretty fast. With Parksville, you're at least we used to be an all in that motel, and we just all whenever you just wanted, you'd come out and gather on the lawn and mm -hmm. hang out for the evening. It was uh, <laughs> merry, merriment, much yes. merriment. <laughs> always, there's always merriment. Yeah. Yeah, we always, we always were, were able to bring beer. Oh God, that's great stuff. Um, 
So we're, we're closing in on an hour, believe it or not. Okay. And, okay. and you know, I, I, I love talking sandcastles and sandcastle stories. I can do it forever. Um, but I, I guess as part of kind of some last thoughts, it's uh, where, where does the future take Dan Belcher? <laughs> what, what, what are some of your your goals for where where you're gonna go? Uh, what are some of your dreams for what 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 to study next or explore next in sand sculpture? You know, it's funny. I don't know because especially with this COVID thing hitting, it mm -hmm. has really taken a bite out of um, sand sculpture this year. So um, it's nice to have some time off of a lot of that. But it's also when you do get a call about a project, you're so happy to get you know, back on the road or, or even projects at home. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm hoping that I can just take more enjoyment out of the projects that I'm in. Um, I'll have to say after working with, the way I grew up in sand was working with Todd and then with Sandscapes and particularly with uh, Greg Glenn was a great one on this is I learned so much from him first time I worked with him on a Todd project and then doing the contests is uh, the he was just relentless as a, a with a work ethic as so many people in sand sculpture were but, but you just never, you know, you never uh, let your guard down. You always, you, know, you always kept on on schedule because I think with Todd, Todd would always add, want to add so many things in. You'd think you're getting close to being done and you turned around and he started a new pound up. You're like, well, it's nine o'clock on the last day, you know? So with Greg, you, I learned how to, he taught me how when I was working with Todd, it's like, don't ask, just do, you know, just make things happen. You know, Todd will do his things. He'll guide you to where he wants you to go. But if you see, if you see something that needs starting, just start it, just get it moving. And working with Greg, um, I found that a lot of what I ended up doing was being a, a workhorse. And I didn't mind that. I enjoyed that. I love the physicality of it. But I think one of the things, it's been kind of a double-edged sword because one one thing that I think has kept me busy over all this time and why I keep getting employed by a lot of people is that I will always finish what I'm working on. I will always help someone after I'm done. I will always make sure that the project, you know, um, that the project gets completed. Uh, I hate not hitting that deadline. That is, that is our goal is to make good artwork but to do it in, you know, in the timely fashion. But I also realized that you give up a lot of creativity when you do that. I will tend to sacrifice um, the fine detail um, because I'm working so hard, I think, you know, what in my mind anyway. So now I'm, I'm trying to find more enjoyment in in the details and trying to find projects or niches, even if it's not the whole project, maybe I find one corner of it where I really get to put my heart and soul into it. And I'm just trying to keep learning. I, I gotta tell you, at going through this so many years and meeting so many people, so many wonderful artists and, and to get to work with these people and watch their creative process and just to say, okay, take away, you know, for me to look at myself and say, take away, um, take away your mode of doing this. Work with this person. You know, I'll, I'll find, I find that working these doubles contests with different people, people I've known for so long is so much fun. It can be a little stressful because it'll be new, but I'll see, okay, that's how they approach this aspect either creative, creatively or um, functionally. And so it, it gets your brain moving in different, in different ways. So as far as what sand holds for me, I don't know. I hope to keep doing it for quite a while. There are times when I'm done with a few projects and I come home and I say, I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. I don't ever want to do this again. I'm tired of being hot. I'm tired of being cold. I'm tired mm -hmm. of being in the rain. I'm tired of being exhausted. And then after I haven't done it for a while, I'm like, Get me out of here. Get me out of here. You know, somebody calls you. It's like, hey, do you want to go? Yes, I want to go. <laughs> well, um, 
our teammate Ko Tanaka paid you a wonderful compliment, Dan. He he was sculpting with you against you in a competition up in Canada uh, okay. recently in this last year. And I, I know we're not supposed to talk about that contest at all. <laughs> right. um, there's confidentiality <laughs> on that one. Uh, so we won't talk about who won or what happened. But he said, that Dan Belcher is fast. <laughs> He's good. And, um, and I said, yeah, there's a reason why he is one of the top artists in this business. He gets asked to go to places like, like Totori and show off his work and show off his skill. Um, and, you know, he, through his passion, he's earned what he's accomplished. And I say that from the heart. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, your work has been inspiring for me. I see it and, and love it and, and watch it. And I've, I think I voted for it to win in contests when I've ever had to judge it. Um, I as, appreciate it. Yeah, so it was it's, a, very, it's a high honor from you and it's a high honor from Poe. So thank you. It was a pleasure getting to work next to him. And uh, um, yeah, not to cut you off, but I was, you know, uh, I don't even know if I can say who I was working with, but uh, someone, uh, someone who's uh, a great artist and whose work I had always admired, competed against and who always, this person wins all the time. Just a, a great imaginative carver. And it was fun to work with that teammate. And it was one where I basically did say that, okay, you, you were the one who decided who, who was coming to this contest first. He had asked me to be his partner. I wasn't first pick, that's fine, but I got to be, uh, to team with him. And I basically said, okay, I love the way you create, create uh, creatively approach these prod, these things, these projects. I said, if you want my input, uh, you know, we're a team, but you know, I wanted him to focus on the detail aspects. So I said, it, it, these kind of, these daily contests were so short as if I'll make sure we finish, you know, I'll get the back, I'll get the sides, I'll make sure everything else is clean and done and we get all the other aspects. Right. You know, and for me, I guess that's also my comfort zone is to say, okay, I know that I can accomplish that goal. If somebody else is doing the wild part, I'll cover the ground. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I know when, when uh, I partnered with Sue McGrew at the Canadian National Expo, I guess that was in 15, um, we made a great team because I did a similar thing. I said, Sue, I, I believe in your creative genius. She's a very talented uh, sculptor. Uh, maybe very we'll lovely. get her in one of these <laughs> uh, interviews. And uh, um, it's great when you end up with a, a relationship where you can say, uh, you're going to be a lead and I'm gonna be a follow. And I'll always give you ideas or inspire you or whatever. Um, then you're not always banging heads against each other but you're you're a team trying to get the best result and we we fell into a great groove where she did some beautiful parts to that thing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i helped kind of bring the whole thing together by just being fast and using shovels to carve with you know how that is <laughs> um and well and somebody like sue she will admittedly say she gets she gets so many thoughts going in that she will she'll freeze she's got so many good things that she wants to come up with. And she, it's good to have somebody, especially like you, where you just come and say, I'll get this. You, you move on what you want to do. And that frees her up to, you know, focus on the genius yeah. she does. And I think we can all do that. I think we can all, when we're, yeah. when we're under the gun to be the creative aspect, um, there are so many different ways you can go. And sometimes it's nice to have someone say, focus on that. You know, I'm going to get the other side. Don't worry about it. I'll come back if you need a hand. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any closing thoughts, any, anything that we didn't talk about that you want to kind of like tell our YouTube audience? Uh, well, I've got, I've got so many, I think so many stories of, of, of things that have happened over projects. I've got two, you know, I've got a couple stories of, of utter failure. Like you talk about having a collapse in a contest. The first time I was with Sandscapes, we had this 
right as the rain hit, this horrible torrential rain hit on the beach the second day we were doing this experimental piece and we decided to open the last form on the last, on, on, at, the, at the, the last hour of that day, just to see how things were gonna hold. We opened the form, the skies opened, the cracks opened, and it was disaster from there mm -hmm. on out. But it was one of those things that, even though that ended that day, just ended up with us being drenched and, and just Born out, trying right? to get all this sand back up and realizing that it was a, it was a Sisyphusian effort is because as much as we rolled up the hill, more rolled back down the hill and we were getting pelted and it was hail and rain. And, you know, we went back to the, the room that night and took showers and had a few beers and sat in a circle and thought, what are we going to do? Well, we can't, we can't redo what we did, but we, we knew we had six hours the next day to make something. And we had a few elements and we had fun with it. And I learned from those guys that day early on that you just, you, you never walk away, you know, you right, never right. walk away. Even if you know, you, we knew we wouldn't be in the, in the running, but you know, we're going to make a good display out there. We're going to show them that we came, we came, you know, guns a blazing to do the best that we could, you know? And uh, another one we had, I was with, Fred Dobbs working for Todd and we had an aftershock from the Northridge earthquake, LA earthquake from that. Was, uh, so we were there in February of 94 as my first earthquake. And we had a 27 foot tall castle that was carved one third of the way down. And we were there when the earthquake hit and that thing came top came tumbling down. And that was one of the most devastating things I had ever seen. And, Luckily, nobody got hurt, but once again, you, you know, you reorganize and you, you make it happen again. And that's sometimes you can get so dejected, especially with sand, because it, it, you can make it stay, but sand's natural inclination is to, is to find its angle of repose. And anytime you're pushing beyond that, you're, 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 you're pushing the limits. You never know what's going to happen. So it's, it's a constant it's a constant struggle between the two, but you never, you never quit. You know? Great advice. I love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Super Dan. Well, thanks so much for taking your valuable time and sharing your <laughs> stories with us. Well, thank you for having there me. There were more stories. There were more stories. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot of stories that I'll never tell because it's all about, you know, it's, it's, well, you know, we all, we all have the stories about the people and those are, those are fun, but those will, those will stay between all of us. <laughs> yeah, right. More project stories, though. Always. Yeah. Well, of course, oh. with so many wonderful projects. How do you even begin? Yes. I, I get it. So, uh, with that though, I think we'll do a, a wrap and say thank you, everybody, for sticking with us as long as you have in the YouTube audience. Yes. Thank you. Um, remember to smash the like button. Remember to subscribe to our channel share share this leave video a with comment your friends. so you know <laughs> I, I don't know dan if you subscribe to our channel yet but you better hurry up and subscribe so that you have you, yeah you see when we uh, actually post this video and and uh tell our next interview we've got a lot more planned yes. thank you so people. much dan for giving up your time we really appreciate it well yeah, thank you for having people. me once again i'm i'm honored especially considering <laughs> you know who you've had before me and and i know who you'll have after me, I'm 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 honored to be a part of this uh, this family, and, and thank you for. <laughs> We're just trying to share and bring people together, and you know, and don't forget about sand sculpture when this whole COVID thing is over. We're all here, and we all want to work and come together, and and you know, we're it's a live art. We all want to be together. Right. Well said. Well said, Kathy. <laughs> well said. So, uh, with that, we'll we'll say we'll see you at the beach sometime real soon, and hopefully we see you at a contest real soon, Dan. Or sounds good. Commissioned event that we find a way yes, to get. Yes. Yes. And, okay. um, <laughs> and we're, like I said, we're going to interview a lot of people, and I, I hope you'll start to see all these stories intertwined. And as you start to watch all these stories, you'll you'll kind of see this this network or fabric. It's already happening. That um, mm -hmm. is happening. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to start interviewing some of the people that you mentioned um, were inspiring to you and helped get you 
you know, uh, kick-started moving in this wonderful world of sand sculpture. And so many I, I haven't even named. And it's funny, and, and as you say, the, this big world of sand sculpture continues to grow uh, more and more people all the time. It's constantly inspiring. It just, you, you can either look around and say, oh, I'll never get to that level, or oh, they've passed me, or you can say, no, I'm, just, I'm gonna keep, I'm just gonna keep progressing. And yeah, keep, 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 growing, yeah. keep growing my world. Excellent, well said. Well, thanks, thanks for joining us, Dan Belcher, and thank you, uh, audience, for sticking with us. And I can't wait to get this video out to you guys so you can see it, and then for us to get uh, uh, on the beach and doing more mm -hmm. more projects, either on the mm -hmm. beach or in in convention halls or whatever. And I I sense it's going to happen soon. I think so. so. Yeah. Thanks again, Dan. Thank well, you. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.